Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. In this show, we'll continue to explore where to find trout in streams, as you'll discover there's much more to finding trout than just looking at rocks and currents. That fish has already refused that fly. You're gonna to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Maine Office of Tourism, Yellowstone Teton Territory, Crazy Rainbow Ranch, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. Everything you learn about reading the water can change with the sudden flush of a thunderstorm or just a few weeks progression of the season. And what you learn in one river may not be as valid as in a river with a different character and different kinds of food. So you need to be flexible and keep an eye on how things change. Trout can and will move throughout the season, but may also move into different water during any 24 hour period. What's most common is a trout that lies in a relatively protected spot for most of the day, still feeding in that position, but perhaps not as aggressively. When a heavy hatch of insects gets going, especially in the evenings when the light gets low, trout move into slower, shallower water where it's easier to sip large number of insects in a short amount of time. The tail of a pool is a common place, but any slower, shallower water close to deep water or to other cover can be a prime spot. A good strategy is to fish the most likely spots near cover or deeper water when there's no insect hatch. But if you see an abundance of insects on the water, start looking at the slower, shallower water you might normally ignore. Trout also move throughout the season to match flow conditions and depth. Just because you catch trout in a spot in April doesn't mean it'll be a good spot in May or June. And where you catch them in June might be barren of fish in August. In winter and early spring, they prefer deeper, slower water because they aren't feeding much and need a place to stay away from heavy current. Look for trout in places where they have some access to current because they actually need a bit of current to hold their position. But when water temperatures are low, they don't need as much food and seldom move very far to feed. A good philosophy is to look for places where trout might loaf in both large and small rivers and streams. Trout will move into these places called winter refuges where they don't waste energy, are protected from predators, but can still nibble on drifting insects if the water warms up a few degrees. Log jams and deep pools are especially good spots, and although they're difficult to fish, trout will slide out in the open close to log jams when they decide to feed. Time of day is important in winter and early spring. Although trout might feed anytime, the most logical time is the middle of the day. Just a few degrees of water temperature increase can put trout on the feed, and fishing can quickly heat up in the middle of the afternoon. They may even rise to small mayflies or midges at this time of year, although the most productive way to fish is with small nymphs. Spring runoff with both cold water temperatures and high flows can just make fly fishing difficult. Trout won't move into shallower water yet, and it'll stay glued to the bottom in these slower places but you'll have trouble getting your fly down to their level, and because they won't move much for a fly, you have to get it right in their face. My only suggestion is to fish in places where you just know trout will be holding, and make sure that you get your fly close to the bottom and that it drifts at the same speed as the current. This is where methods like Euronymphing really shine. As waters drop in the spring or after runoff, Trout move from their winter holding areas into faster, shallower water. This water is where the insects hatch and drift, and trout move into it to take maximum advantage of the abundant food. Some might stay in these deep pools, 
but you'll begin to find fish in faster, shallower water. In other words, they'll just be more spread out. When midsummer low water rolls around, you'll find trout close to faster water, especially riffles. Because current brings them food, and as water levels fall, current will be restricted only to discrete places. Riffles on the surface are almost as effective as rocks or logs at hiding trout from predators, especially from birds of prey like ospreys and eagles. You may also find them in deeper pools, but always look for that foam line, which is like a beacon that tells you where food is drifting. Trace the foam line down through a deep pool and you'll be able to predict exactly where trout feed. It doesn't matter whether it's a mayfly that hatched in a riffle or a beetle that fell into the water. All the good food gets swept into that foam line. You know, sometimes you have to temper what you know about reading the water with the actual conditions and what you see on the water. For instance, we've been going through a lot of slow, flat pools today with beautiful looking water, deep banks, stuff that looks like it should hold fish, but it didn't, or we, at least we didn't catch any. We've caught all of our fish in the faster riffles, even though water temperature is perfectly fine for fish to be in those deeper pools. So based on what we found out today, this to me looks like a really good spot. It's in a riffle, it's in faster water, it's got a foam line going down it so you know there's food drifting down there. Anything that hatches or falls in the river is going to get down that foam line. And it's got a little bit of, of a deep cut, just a little depression like a trench in there. And I know it's deeper for two reasons. One is that the water gets a little darker color, a little bit deeper color. And the other reason I know it's a little deeper is the rocks all of a sudden disappear. So I can see all the rocks on the bottom right here in front of me. And as I start to look down there, all the rocks get fuzzy and then they disappear. So I know there's a deep little trough in here. And because we found fish in fast water today, this looks like a really good spot. It's true that lower water temperatures in the fall make trout more active, especially in places where summer water temperatures may get too high for a healthy trout population, and the fish can be stressed to the point where we should stop fishing for them. In cooler fall water temperatures, trout will be in all kinds of water, from fast riffles to deep pools. But trout in the fall don't feed as much as they do in spring and summer. They don't hurry to pack on weight for the winter. Trout are not grizzly bears. Yes, they will feed, but not as actively as they did in spring and summer, so you need to lower your expectations. Brook and brown trout spawn in the fall, so you may find them in odd places as they move through a system to their spawning grounds, and sometimes they do odd things in the fall. So you know what? Sometimes you can do everything wrong and still catch a fish. That big brown trout was sipping little tiny bugs. My dry fly went past him, he didn't take it. I was stripping the line in, and all of a sudden we saw this torpedo coming after the fly. A smart old brown trout chasing a dry fly stripped upstream. Go figure that one. Rookies and browns also get more aggressive prior to spawning and will attack streamers, which is why some anglers think they're feeding more heavily. They aren't, they're just getting nasty which is why you often get short strikes to streamers in the fall. These fish are not eating, but merely trying to get potential threats out of their way. Some of them move only 50 yards for spawning, while others migrate many miles. What happens when you get a big rainstorm and the water in your river is dirty and two feet higher than it was last week? What happens to the fish? And can they still be caught? Trout have adapted to floods for hundreds of thousands of years, and they're seldom bothered by high water they don't get washed away. As the water gets higher, the velocity at the surface gets much faster, but those little one foot per second niches they occupy don't change much. The water velocity changes very little near the river bottom. Trout will either wait it out in their normal resting places or they'll move into slower, shallower water along the banks. If they just hang tight in deeper water, they're tough to catch because you just can't get a fly down to them with all that fast water on the surface. You have to wait until the water drops or fish with a lot of weight to get your fly down to them. Those that move into the banks can be caught if you make careful casts into shallow water. Even if the water is high and dirty, you may see fish rising. But if not, work a nymph carefully. 
even in places that might have been dry before the rainstorm. A great tactic to use during high water is a streamer fished actively. When streams flood, minnows and crayfish get pushed out of their normal haunts and get disoriented. They're much more vulnerable to predators and trout sense this and often go on the prowl. All these fish are relating to the outside of the bank current seam. Started having some nice success. They do want down in that grass. They do, protection, right? Yep, cover protection, nice. Good fish, great couple. Good healthy fish. If you know what species of trout are in a river, should you adjust your stream reading variables? Are there any differences between where the various species of trout live in a river? For the most part, the various trout species have overlapping habitats, and you often find them mixed together. But if you know a river contains mainly one species of trout, you can narrow your options by looking for the habitat they prefer most. Rainbow trout are better adapted to feeding in fast water. Their metabolisms are more efficient than those of other trout, so they're able to feed in water that's faster than other species prefer. But don't just look for rainbows in fast riffles and heads of pools. They can be anywhere in a river, and I've seen them in very slow water as often as in fast water. So look in all likely places in rainbow trout water, but don't ignore the very fast stuff that you might pass up in brown trout or cutthroat rivers. In my experience, where brooks, browns, and rainbows seem to require a physical break in the current in order to be comfortable in fast water, I've watched rainbows sip tiny midges in tumbling water that would seldom hold a brown or a brook trout. Rainbows seem to be able to surf the plumes of water in fast current finding places where they can suspend and feed even when there's no cover nearby. The... Oh, there we go. Well, that was in a regular riser, but uh, we were able to convince that fish to take a dry. Gotta love rainbow trout when they jump. God, these North Platte fish are all oh, just so beautiful. Hefty fish. I don't think we've caught a small fish <laughs> since we've been here. Hey, we might land this one yeah, for us. This is looking promising. It's <laughs> a pretty fish. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. One to the net. Nice job. Rainbows also seem to be more migratory than other species, even in smaller rivers where there's no outlet to a big lake or the ocean. In the tiniest mountain river, they can often act like miniature steelhead. They may be in one stretch of river today and gone a few days later. So when you fish rivers with rainbow trout, don't be afraid to move around a lot, even if you caught a bunch in this pool last week. Rainbows and cutthroats often interbreed, and in many rivers with both species, you may find hybrids. Most of these look more like rainbows, but they have a telltale red cut mark on the bottom of their jaws. Although biologists tell us it is almost sure impossible like to tell a true cutthroat or rainbow without a DNA analysis, I found that if a fish looks more like a rainbow, it behaves more like a rainbow. And if it looks like a cut, it will act more like a cutthroat. Brown trout evolved in the slower, richer waters of Europe and are more likely to be in the slower parts of pools and runs than in the very fast water. Although I've caught plenty of them in fast water, as long as there are little pockets of slower water somewhere. But you'll find them more often closer to structure and in slower water than rainbows. 
Unlike other trout species, they seem to be more like binge feeders. If there's not a hatch or otherwise abundant food, they may kick back and be difficult to take at some times a day. We like to call them moody. Also, brown trout are much more likely to feed in periods of low light than other species, early in the morning, just before dark, and at night. If you know a river has mostly brown trout in the population, don't be discouraged if you don't catch fish right away or the river seems to be barren of fish. The browns can turn on with just a slight change in light conditions. And on dark, rainy, or misty days, you'll often find brown trout more eager to play. Maybe it's because they're more cautious, or maybe it's because you often find more insects hatching on cloudy days, bringing brown trout out into feeding positions. Whenever I have a choice of what day to fish a brown trout river, I always look for lousy weather. Cutthroat trout, although they're closely related to rainbows, prefer slower water, similar to that where you find brown trout. Like browns, they often prefer to feed close to cover, especially the large ones. One aspect of cutthroats you should be aware of is that they like to feed in very shallow water, especially during a hatch. When cutthroats are around, Pay careful attention to water that is even shallower than that two to four foot depth where we usually look for trout. I've watched them feeding in riffles with their backs out of the water. Cutthroats are very surface oriented and in rivers where you find them, a dry fly is almost always your best choice. That old platitude about trout feeding 90% below the surface just does not apply to cutthroats. And often, when I fish a hopper-dropper combination in cutthroat water, I'll catch most of my fish on the dry, and they seem to ignore the nymph. Another important aspect of cutthroat behavior is they seem to rise very slowly to a dry fly. And if you're accustomed to catching rainbows or brookies, you'll often pull the fly out of their mouths, especially big ones. You need to pause just a bit when setting the hook on cutthroats. And you may have heard that cutthroats are dumb and easy to catch. That may be true on some of them in wilderness waters, but I don't think the Snake River strain of cutthroats have gotten the memo. Those fish can be tough and selective. Mark Melnick and I once fished over a huge rising cutthroat for three hours, taking turns. When we left the fish, it was still rising, but we had to admit defeat. I'm at the utmost of frustration right now, but it's a lot of fun because there's a giant cutty still feeding over there. I've whiffed on them five or six times, had five or six fly changes. Um, one of us is gonna give up soon and it isn't gonna be me. Brook trout prefer to be close to the main current but off to the edges of the faster water. Like browns, they prefer to be closer to cover. Brook trout evolved in the nutrient poor environment of mountain rivers and the colder, less fertile waters of higher altitudes and latitudes. So they position themselves in places to take maximum advantage of drifting food. In northern rivers, where they coexist with pike and rivers, they also stay in the main current flows to keep away from the pike, which don't like fast current. And in these places, where brook trout grow large but have a short growing season, they take advantage of every piece of protein they can grab. They are every bit as voracious on mouse patterns as brown trout in these locations. We often call brook trout dumb because they seem to be easier to catch, but they're supremely adapted to cold, infertile waters where neither brown trout nor rainbow trout can survive because there's not enough food. Brook trout have just evolved to take advantage of every possible piece of food in the water. They eat first and ask questions later. Next, we'll talk about how you can locate trout and even predict what flies will work with just a quick glance at the water. Now's a good time to explain tailwaters, spring creeks, limestone streams, and freestone streams. These are non-scientific terms that anglers use to divide trout streams into various classes based on the source of a river and its geology. The terms are confusing to many people, but these classifications tell us a lot about trout habitat and where to find trout. Freestone streams are flowing waters fed mainly by snowmelt and seasonal rains with minimal influence by underground springs. By nature, they're unstable 
and water levels fluctuate greatly throughout the season. They also typically flow over impermeable rock like shale and sandstone or crystalline rocks like granite. Dissolved solids will be low and the pH in these streams is typically on the acidic side. Because of their unstable nature and the lack of dissolved nutrients from the impenetrable rocks, these streams typically have a sparse food supply. Trout grow slower in these streams and because food is limited, trout will most often be found close to the main current flows that supply food. Although the food supply is sparser than in other kinds of streams, it can be quite diverse. In these streams, you'll find all kinds of aquatic insects, especially bigger varieties of mayflies and stoneflies. Bigger, bulkier flies work well in these streams because trout are accustomed to eating bigger bugs. Terrestrials are also a very important part of a trout's diet because aquatic insects are not as abundant. Because of the sparse food supply, trout will be eager to pounce on most flies if presented properly. You can identify freestone streams by their water color and stability. Water in freestone streams when they're not in flood, of course, will be either crystal clear with little algae on the rocks and no aquatic vegetation, or the water may be stained a tea color from tannic acid derived from snow and rain runoff through woodlands. Also, their banks will show signs of frequent high water. They often have wide gravel banks and signs of recent floods, like driftwood piled up on gravel bars and flood debris high up in the trees. You may have heard the term limestone stream, which is used more commonly in the east. When waters run through limestone or dolomite, calcium and magnesium salts dissolve into the water, producing what we call hard water. In ways that are not completely understood by scientists, these minerals stimulate both plant and insect growth, giving trout a more abundant food supply. These salts are also necessary for the growth of crustaceans like crayfish, scuds, and sow bugs, which further increases the food available to trout. Trout in these streams grow larger, and along with standard insect imitations, flies that imitate crustaceans are very effective. Dissolved solids in these streams can be quite high, and the pH of these waters will be more on the alkaline side. Because of the rich food supply, trout may also feed in places more removed from the main current flow, like backwaters or in slower current. They don't need to lie in the main current to get enough food. Trout will be pickier here about fly selection than in freestone rivers, and frequent fly changes might be necessary. They have a lot of food available and they can afford to be choosy. Limestone streams will have more aquatic vegetation than freestone streams, especially in backwaters. You can also identify them because the water almost always has a slight milky tinge from the abundance of dissolved minerals in the water. Spring creeks are streams where most of the water comes directly from underground springs. These typically happen in limestone bedrock because limestone is porous and often forms large underground rivers that eventually come to the surface. The flow in these streams is very stable because they are little influenced by snowmelt or rainfall. This extreme stability combined with lots of minerals in the water makes for a perfect environment for trout. Current is typically slow and steady, the water is always clear, and aquatic vegetation is abundant. Water temperatures and flows are nearly constant throughout the season, making for a very rich food supply for trout in a long growing season. With these slower flows, rich food, and constant flows, trout can and will live almost anywhere. Thus, it's very tough to read the water in a spring creek because trout aren't concentrated in certain areas. It's always best to be cautious and look for trout everywhere. And luckily, because of the clear water, you can spot them easily. But Spring Creek trout, because they have an abundance of food and the water is clear, can be very difficult regarding fly selection and presentation. This is PhD fishing.
tailwaters are rivers formed by the outflow of a reservoir. When water flows into a deep reservoir, temperature stratifies with cold water remaining near the bottom even during the heat of the summer. If the water coming out of a dam comes from the bottom of a reservoir, which it usually does, the water will be constant as that in a spring creek. Warmer than a freestone river in the winter and colder in the summer. In addition, the reservoirs concentrate nutrients in the water, so the outflow is rich in nutrients and offers trout abundant food. Tailwaters exhibit different characters as they flow downstream from dams. Close to dams, trout have a rich food supply with midges and crustaceans in abundance and trout occupying many different locations. So like a spring creek, these waters are tough to read. Trout may be fussy about fly patterns and trout may be found almost anywhere. As you get further downstream from the dam, the food supply gets less abundant but more diverse with more stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies making up the insect food. Here you should begin to look for trout in the more obvious places like riffles, current seams, and heads and tails of pools. That is 4X on there, right? It is. Wow. Yeah, they're hot. Yeah. You can see why I cut the five off. Yeah. <laughs> Not all streams fit neatly into these classifications. Some tailwaters exhibit more like a freestone character and others are more productive than spring creeks. Some limestone streams look like freestone rivers but still have a richer food supply. These are only basic guidelines on a huge continuum of trout stream types and many rivers can exhibit the characteristics of all types. Don't take everything you've learned here as gospel. Every trout stream is a little bit different and the places you find fish in your stream might be a little bit different than the places you've learned here. I've tried to give you just a few tips and tricks on where to look for trout. But when you put it all together and you read the water and you say, I think there's going to be a trout over there and you put your fly in there and you catch a trout, it's one of the most satisfying parts of fly fishing. Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this and you want to see more, subscribe and you can get all our weekly uploads. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Main Office of Tourism, Yellowstone Teton Territory, Crazy Rainbow Ranch, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery.